Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night by Dylan Thomas Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Though wise men at their end no dark is right, because their words had forked no lightning, they do not go gentle into that good night. Good men, the last wave by, crying how bright their frail deeds might have danced in a green bay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Wild men who caught and sang the sun in flight and learned too late they grieved it on its way. Do not go gentle into that good night. Grave men, near death, who see with blinding sight blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And you, my father, there on the sad height, curse, bless me now with your fierce tears, I pray. Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Welcome to Lit Poetry. Born in Swansea, Wales, Dylan Thomas is famous for his acutely lyrical and emotional poetry, as well as for his turbulent personal life. His poetry is hard to categorise. In his life, he avoided becoming involved with literary groups or movements. Thomas can be seen in some ways as an extension into the 20th century of the earlier historical movement called Romanticism, particularly in its emphasis on imagination, emotion, intuition, and spontaneity. Written sometime after 1945, it could be argued that the events of World War II cast a long shadow over Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. Throughout the war, the Nazis bombed towns and cities across the United Kingdom, and Thomas, a Welsh poet, would have been exposed to these profound wartime experiences. Indeed, Thomas would have seen the human cost of the war firsthand, both in terms of the soldiers who died in battle, the civilians who died in air raids, and the efforts to rebuild a broken country. As such, while the poem is traditionally seen as a meditation on the universal question of how human beings can face death with dignity, one might speculate that the poem is also a response to the intense human suffering experienced throughout World War II. In the face of a global conflict that showed just how expendable human life can be, the poem rallies against these events and passionately argues that life should be strongly clung to wherever possible. This interpretation, of course, reflects the defiance with which the United Kingdom refused to give up its life and vitality to an invading force. Form. Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night is a villanelle, a poetic form invented by French poets during the 16th century. This rather rigid poetic form was very popular in the Victorian period, with its strict social and sexual norms and its relatively conservative poets. For Thomas to therefore write a villanelle in the late 1940s was to be a bit out of step with the modernist direction of poetry being pioneered at the time by poets like T.S. Eliot and Ezra Pound. In Dylan Thomas's case, this was a self-conscious and intentional decision he is known to be somebody who rebelled against the modernist movement and sought to revive older forms and tones of poetry. The villanelle is a fixed poetic form. It not only has a set 
rhyme scheme. It also has a predetermined pattern of refrains and a set number of lines, which are in turn organized into a set number of stanzas. A villanelle is a 19 line poem. Its first five stanzas are three lines long. Its final stanza is four lines. In the first stanza, line one, and three establish the poem's refrains or repeated lines. The first line of the poem repeats at the end of stanzas two and four and as the second to last line of the poem as well. In turn, the third line of the poem repeats at the end of stanzas three and five as well as the poem's final line. In the final two lines of the poem, Therefore, the two refrain lines are paired up, forming a rhyming couplet. A villanelle is thus a complex demanding form with an ornate repetitive structure. It is well suited to a poem with an obsessive or anxious outlook. Poems, for instance, where the speaker is working through a consuming fear, where the speaker can't get some idea out of his or her head. Do not go gentle into that good night is that kind of a poem. It's about one of the scariest things of all, death. And though the speaker urges the reader to fight bravely against death, the obsessive repetition of lines such as rage, rage against the dying of the light suggests that the speaker hasn't quite mastered his fear of death. That the speaker has to keep reminding both the reader and himself to fight against it. meter. In English, villanelles are often written in iambic pentameter, a meter with a de dum de dum de da unstressed stressed rhythm that goes on for five feet, making ten syllables total per line. Do not go gentle into that good night follows this tradition. One can hear that rhythm in the poem's fifth line, because their words had forked no lightning they. However, Although the poem is written mostly in iambic pentameter, it occasionally adopts a metrical variation. For instance, line three opens with a spondee, two stressed syllables that appear side by side, rage, rage, against the dying of the light. The extra stress in the first foot unbalances the line and makes it a little awkward and abrasive. But this awkwardness is part of the speaker's point. He wants to emphasize his rage and thereby encourage people to fight against death with all their bravery and ferociousness, even if that means getting a little worked up. The use of spondees occurs also in lines 7, 10, 13 and 14 with the words good men, wild men, grave men, blind men, in addition to the four rage rage lines spread throughout the poem. The result is the poem feels very insistent. One feels the force of the speaker's passion in these repeated spondees. The meter thus echoes the energy and pain of the poem, the intense energy with which the speaker is making his point. Rhyme scheme. Villanelles follow a very tightly controlled and limited rhyme scheme. Indeed, there are only two rhymes in the whole poem, words ending with "-ite", and "-a". The first five stanzas of the poem, lines 1 to 15, are all rhymed "-a", "-b", "-a". By using only two rhymes, of course, one could argue that the poem lacks a degree of lyrical freedom. Moreover, all of its rhymes are perfect rhymes and exclusively single-syllable words. Indeed, there are no tricky, complicated rhymes in the poem. Its rhymes are straightforward and forceful. As such, because of the limited number of rhymes, the, the poem feels obsessive once more, as though the speaker is stuck on a single idea and can't get past it. But because the rhymes are so strong, the reader feels like the speaker is being direct and straightforward. It feels as though the speaker is talking to the reader without ambiguity or equivocation, saying exactly what he or she thinks without beating around the bush. Themes. Resisting death. 
Within the poem, the speaker acknowledges that death is inevitable. Everyone dies sooner or later. But that doesn't mean that people should simply give up and give in to death. Instead, the speaker argues that people should fight fiercely and bravely against death. Indeed, the speaker suggests that death helps to clarify something that people too often forget, that life is precious and worth fighting for. Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night tries to teach its readers how to face death by resisting it and trying to win more time and more life. The speaker wants people to rage, rage against death. They should burn and rave, fight fiercely and bravely as their lives approach the end. One might wonder though why the speaker wants people to fight against death if it's ultimately inescapable. The speaker answers this question by describing a series of different people who fight against death. Wise men, good men, wild men and grave men. When these people are confronted with death, they realise that they haven't accomplished everything they want to. They all have regrets and they all fight for more time. Here, the wise men are people who seem to have a deep understanding of life. If anyone could be counted on to live their lives fully, one might think it would be these people. Indeed, these wise men do recognise something fundamental, that dark is right. In other words, they know that they have to one day die. However, these wise men have misgivings about what they've accomplished in life and they want to accomplish more. Their words, the speaker notes, however, have forked no lightning. Lightning here is used to symbolise inspiration and change. In other words, this line is saying that these wise men haven't had a burst of inspiration that would help them to change the direction of the world the way that forked lightning does or can do. Nor have their words inspired anyone else. So they fight for more life in the hope that such inspiration will come. After the wise men, lines seven to eight, describe how another group of people typically respond to death. In this case, the speaker focuses on good men. They are near death. The last wave has gone by them. The last wave is a metaphor that describes the last significant moments of their lives. All that the good men have in front of them is death, but they aren't satisfied with their lives. They are crying out in pain and protest. Their frail deeds, the weak or insignificant things these good men have done, could have been bright, that is glorious and worthwhile and figuratively could have danced in a green bay. In other words, they would have celebrated, been full of joy and spent their time in a peaceful, happy place. But since their deeds weren't bright, these men rage, rage against the dying of a light. In other words, they fight passionately for more time, more life. Once again, the refrain line works a little differently than in the opening stanza. Here, it describes how the good men actually do act rather than how one should act. That's an interesting difference. Similarly, the wild men that the speaker describes in lines 10 to 12 have spent their lives in a joyous and reckless fashion as they have caught and sang the sun in flight. This is a metaphor and it describes how the wild men have pursued pleasure and joy with reckless abandon, going as far as to fly up to the sun. They are your typical Epicureans and hedonists who attempt to suck the marrow out of life, but when they face death, they realise that they have grieved it on its way. In other words, they realise that they have regrets about the frivolous way they have spent their time on earth. Thus, they fight for more time so that they can do something more worthwhile. The example of the wild men can be read as an allusion to the myth of Icarus. Using wings his father made for him, Icarus flies up towards the sun. However, because the wings are made of wax, they melt and Icarus plunges into the sea. Like the wild men, Icarus ends up grieving his own wild pursuit of the sun. Finally, the last stereotypical figure is presented in lines 13 to 15. These are the grave or serious men. The grave men have made an error of judgment, an error they only recognise when they are near death. They thought that 
blind eyes were dull and lifeless, that they had no light in them, but they suddenly see with blinding sight that they were wrong. In other words, these serious men have a powerful revelation. They learn that blind eyes could blaze like meteors and be gay. This simile here compares the intense expression in a blind person's eyes to meteors. A meteor is a chunk of space rock burning up as it enters the Earth's atmosphere. It's extremely bright, even if it only lasts for a few moments. And gay here means full of joy and happiness. The meteors, thus act as a symbol for a flash of intense feeling or inspiration similar to the lightning in line five. So this simile implies that the grave men have learned that blind eyes can be full of light and happiness. In other words, these men who have preferred seriousness over joy realize almost too late that they could have found happiness too. In all these cases then, death helps these very different people realize that their lives are precious and that they need to use their time on earth as best they can. Death offers a kind of corrective, helping them reconnect with what really matters in life. Death is a necessary mechanism, if you will, that potentially helps humans focus their energy by challenging them to harness whatever light remains in their lives. So even though death is inevitable, it's worth fighting bravely against because doing so helps reveal what really matters in life and imbues life with an inherent dignity. Family, grief and loss. In the final stanza of Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, the speaker suddenly switches things up. Although he spent most of the poem talking in general terms about wise men and good men and the like, he suddenly addresses someone specific, his father. This changes the way the poem can be read, transforming it into something deeply personal. The poem offers universal advice about how to face death with dignity, but it is also an intimate and heartfelt message from a son to his dying father. For most of the poem, it's not clear who the speaker is addressing. The speaker talks about death in general terms, discussing how different groups react, which initially makes the poem feel universal in its message. However, once the address to the father is revealed, the poem becomes much less universal and far more human and intimate. In the final stanza, the speaker again underscores the poem's message, urging his father to show resistance in the face of death. The sad height may be an allusion to the Bible's Valley of the Shadow of Death, which appears in Psalm 23. The phrase is often misquoted as simply the Valley of Death, but if death is casting its shadow on the valley, it must be above the valley, like the father on the sad height of the mortal realm. Despite the anguish that this expression of grief and fear would cause him, the speaker longs for his father to cry at his impending death because it would show that his father still has vitality and dignity. It's hard to see our parents, of course, especially traditionally stoic fathers, cry, but it reminds us of the full range of their humanity and the vulnerability that comes with that humanity. Thank you.